Hello, and welcome to the NASA Open House held today in conjunction with the presidential inauguration in 2013. I'm John Yimbrick with NASA Office of Communications, the social media director at NASA, and your host for today. This open house means folks will be coming in and out of the room, and we are welcome to, uh, to take part in today's conversation. But we're doing something also special here today. We have a NASA social, which is where we invite folks in the public to come in, get behind the scenes access to NASA, and communicate that out to their friends and followers. And I believe we have some NASA social guests here in the audience with us today. If you don't mind, just uh, maybe clapping your hands so we know who you are. Great. The NASA social program has been really successful for us in actually uh, connecting and directly with you, the public. And if you want to get more involved in social media at NASA, uh, visit us on the web at nasa.gov slash social. Uh, for today's event, you can follow along with the hashtag uh, pound inaug 2013. That's pound I-N-A-U-G 2013, pound NASA. And for our NASA social guests, pound NASA social. You can also ask us questions using the hashtag pound NASA. NASA. That's ask NASA. That is, uh, you can do that on Twitter or Google+. You can also follow our stream on YouTube and ask questions on Facebook as well. Uh, we are pleased to discuss some of the amazing things we're doing here at NASA with you today. Uh, but to be honest with you, we're only going to be touching the surface of what NASA does. I mean, right now, we have spacecraft that are leaving our solar system right now. We have a spacecraft that is making discoveries on Mercury. We have one that's going out to Pluto. We have spacecraft that are discovering distant planets around distant stars. We have, we're still discovering new galaxies. We have Earth observation satellites that are helping us better understand climate change here on Earth. We have a rover that, are, that is crawling the surface of Mars right now that is paving the way for future Mars exploration to the red planet. We have an engineering marvel, the International Space Station orbiting above, where humans have lived and worked for over 12 years. And if you think about that, seventh graders have never known a world without humans living permanently in space. And with all this stuff we have going on, we're also here on the ground, we're developing the next generation spacecraft that are going to take us out of low Earth orbit and into the solar system, while also investing in commercial spaceflight, which will help us bring down the cost of spaceflight and make it more accessible and affordable for everybody. And through all of this stuff, there's technologies emerge, and these technologies help benefit us here on Earth, to, Earth today. So today you're going to hear from some of the, some of the leaders here at NASA headquarters. Uh, they're going to tell you about some of the exciting things we're doing. And our first guest I'd like to introduce is an American hero. Excuse me. He is a decorated naval aviator who flew over 100 combat missions during the Vietnam War. He's a retired three-star Marine Corps general. He piloted the commander of the space shuttle four times during his career as an astronaut. And despite all of this, all the time he spent in the clouds, he is really down to earth. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden. Hey, thanks very much, John. And um, I want to thank all of you, first of all, for coming. And I welcome you to NASA headquarters. You're going to have a lot of people welcome you to NASA headquarters today. It's a big day for us because it's a big weekend for the nation. Uh, it's a time when we celebrate the memory of um, a great civil rights leader, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, the official celebration of his birthday is next Monday, but it's also a very important day because it's the inauguration day for, uh, for President Barack Obama. And um, I I'm very excited to be here and be a part of the team. I, I also want to thank NASA's Director of Outreach, uh, Alan Ladwig. Um, Alan doesn't, I don't think he gets enough love uh, <laughs> from many of us. And it's because Alan's kind of uh, a freewheeling guy. But he, I tell you, when, when you want something done, give it to him and it gets delivered. And Alan, again, as I said last night, I want to thank you and the entire team for what I think is going to be a, an incredible weekend, not just for NASA, but for the nation, people who have an opportunity to, to see the stuff that we do. Uh, I want to thank my, the, my press secretary. I say my press secretary. It's the NASA press secretary, uh, Lauren Worley. And I saw Lauren roaming around. there. She was roaming around some. There she is. Um, good to have you here, Rudy. And... Uh, Thanks very much for all the stuff you do. I also want to thank, thank all the people on the teams who have been working to help us open the doors of NASA uh, to many of our friends from around the country who are here uh, in the Washington area for the, for the uh, inauguration this weekend. John, uh, our MC for today, John Yembrick, is also NASA's social media manager. And we're very proud here at NASA to um, 
to be considered by many to be a leader in the use of social media. And I understand over the course of the day, we're probably going to have about 100 or so members of our NASA social media network uh, that will be going and coming. John's already asked you all to recognize yourselves, but I want to take a moment just to, to, to talk to others about how important these folk are. Uh, I, I'm going to ask you not only clap, but how about standing up for a moment? People who have been part of the NASA social media uh, group for quite some time. And I, I get to see them a lot. I, I want to applaud you uh, personally. Thank you very much. And, and I want to tell you why I do that. You know, uh, I came to NASA the first time in 1980 um, when I entered the astronaut corps. And I spent 14 years in the agency, and I complained all the time about our inability to get our story out to the public. Uh, I was somewhat notorious as a, young, as a young astronaut candidate. I got in trouble the first time I traveled to, to the Langley Research Center and I made a statement in a, in a uh, David Weaver, our director of, of uh, the Office of Communications, is always worried about what I'm going to say. But I, I was at, uh, at Langley for one of my first forays away from the Johnson Space Center and I think I did something with the, uh, oh, it, it was the pilot or some newspaper in that area and they said, um, you know, what do you think about NASA's public relations efforts? And I said, I think it sucks. <laughs> and uh, he said, what do you mean? I said, we just don't, we don't, we don't effectively tell our story. And um, David won't remember this, but some of the folk in the, in the Office of Communications will. Uh, I came in and, and uh, in the, one of their meetings shortly after I had become the, the NASA administrator, and I apologized because I said, you know, I, I've been blaming the Office of Communications and the Public Relations Department for our failure to tell our story when, in fact, it's my fault. I, I, as the NASA administrator, you know, my job is to be the face and voice of NASA and get our story out. Um, I, I have been frustrated for some time in not being able to do that effectively. And then all of a sudden, uh, we had people like John Yembrick and, and Alan and others who came up with this thing about, uh, you know, NASA socials. Um, we first started calling them tweet-ups. And what we found with the NASA social was we brought people in who could passionately talk about the experience of a NASA event, um, whether it was a launch or something like this. And so the reason we want to thank you is because you have been more effective in helping us tell our story than we ever were for about 50 years. And that is critical. You, you have been a... You have been a revolutionary change in NASA's ability to get its story out to the rest of the world. And what I ask you, some of you who have been with, with me before, you know, I, I ask you, uh, be passionate in your writing and your tweeting and everything else. There are literally millions of people around the world who will read what you say, who will see what you, what you tweet, and uh, they are not fortunate to be here, but they can feel things through you if you write and speak with passion. So uh, that's what we ask you to do. Tell them what it's like to be here um, and tell them what, what you're experiencing and, and you will do far more than you could ever imagine. So I do wanna thank you. As I said, this is a particularly historic weekend, uh, not only for the president and the first family, but for all of us in government and in communities throughout this nation who are ready to build on the progress we've made to make the next four years the best this nation has ever known. As you may know, uh, and I have mentioned earlier, this, year's, um, uh, this year, President Obama's inauguration coincides with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Day and the National Day of Service, both observances that NASA strongly supports. In fact, tomorrow, as John already mentioned, on the National Mall, we'll honor the legacy of the, of the 20th century's greatest civil rights leader by joining 92 national service organizations and 14 federal agencies in an event on the National Mall from 10 a.m., to 5 p.m., designed to connect citizens with volunteer opportunities across the nation. NASA's tent will be on the mall between 14th Street and 12th Street in the education section. Did I get that right? All right. There you'll be able to meet and mingle with several of our astronauts, learn more about uh, ways that you can engage directly with NASA programs. I also understand that you may have an opportunity to meet Mohawk Guy. Uh, of curiosity fame. He is scheduled to be here. He became somewhat of a celebrity as a part of the mission team uh, that completed the unprecedented landing of the Curiosity rover on Mars back in August. 
Later Saturday evening from 5.30 to 9.30 p.m. at the David M. Brown Planetarium in Arlington, Virginia, we're hosting a star party, a chance to stargaze through telescopes that will be set up at the planetarium, and astronomers from NASA and local astronomy organizations will be on hand to discuss and answer any questions that you all may have. Both events are free and open to the public, and I urge all of you who can to take advantage of these unique opportunities. Finally, uh, more NASA astronauts and full-size models of two NASA spacecraft will be featured on Monday's inaugural parade. Uh, the Curiosity rover and our Orion multi-purpose capsule that's under final construction will take our, and will take our astronauts farther into space than ever before uh, will be represented on these floats. To set the stage for all of that, we've put together an exciting program today featuring panel discussions, video presentations, and exhibits to give you a bird's eye view of some of the exciting things that are happening here at NASA. This morning, from now until about 11 o'clock, you'll hear from NASA's top human exploration experts about the progress we're making to send humans farther into space than ever before. That will be followed by a panel discussion that will address the important role that technology and innovation play in advancing the goals of NASA and our economy. We'll conclude the morning session with an 11.30 demonstration of our exoskeleton, a 57-pound robotic, which is undergoing tests at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Has anybody ever seen, not here at NASA headquarters, has anybody ever seen the exoskeleton before? Anybody got a guess what it is? What's your name? The young lady right there, beautiful young lady. What's your name? Sophie? Is that right? Is that your brother, Sophie? The one that's squirming and stuff? <laughs> that's not your brother? That's your son or your brother? No, my son. Your son. What's your name? Aiden? So Aiden and Sophie, uh, are you all going to be around for the exoskeleton about 1130? Okay. It, stand by. It's thrilling. And I'm not going to give you any more stuff, but it's, it's pretty exciting. And we love it because not only do, do we think it has applica applications for astronauts operating in space on the International Space Station or other places in our universe, but it may also have applicability to people here on Earth who, who are not as fortunate as many of us and can't just mobilize around the way that, that many of us do. So stand by for, for the exoskeleton. Um, an astronaut in space could wear this device over his or her body, either to assist or inhibit movement in leg joints. The exoskeleton also holds promise for assisting paraplegics in walking here on Earth. There will be a break around noon, and uh, we have a plethora. That means an abundance, not, of restaurants and uh, fine eateries right here near NASA. You notice I said not. But, but there are places where you can find food that's, that's very close, within walking distance, and we even have a a cafeteria down on the other end of the building. So uh, get a bite to eat and then come back for the afternoon session because we're going to reconvene at 2 for a second set of panel discussions focusing on our science uh, that the astronauts and students here on Earth are conducting on the International Space Station. That will be followed by an update on the Mars Curiosity mission and a panel discussion on our future plans for exploring the Red Planet. Finally, I have to tell you that space exploration is one of the few things that enjoys bipartisan support here in, in Washington, D.C. None of the exciting things we're doing at NASA would be possible without the support of President Obama, the members of Congress of both parties, and most particularly, you. So as we prepare for President Obama's second inauguration, I want to thank him and all of you for your support of America's space program. I especially hope that all the young people who are here Go back home with a heightened passion and a greater understanding of the importance of science, technology, engineering, and math. The STEM disciplines are not only essential to the growth of NASA, they are our, your gateway to the jobs of the future and the keys to American competitiveness in the 21st century. So Sophie, stand by. Hopefully you all will have a phenomenal day. I want to thank all of you again for coming. Enjoy this day and this weekend. Thanks very much.
are the explorers. We have a need to find what is out there. It is a drive inside each and every one of us. The drive to wonder, to push the boundaries, and to explore. We expanded across our lands, settling new frontiers. We took to the oceans and learned that we could cross treacherous expanses in the pursuit of discovery. And then we took to the skies and flew. But that wasn't enough. We left the planet and redefined what was possible. We flew in space. We walked in space. What once was a melodramatic flight of fantasy became reality. Then, a new generation of spaceships captured hearts and minds for three decades and helped build a castle in the sky that is our lasting home in space. We have always looked up. For centuries, we wondered what was on the other side of the sky, and we have begun to answer that question. We have learned that all the exploration humankind has achieved is only a beginning. Right now, men and women are working on the next steps to go farther than we have ever gone before. New vessels will carry us, and new destinations await us. Everything we have ever accomplished leads to this moment in time, where exploration will now take us to the planets and the stars. Our nearest neighbors in the night sky have beckoned us, invited us, dared us to reach for them. We are the explorers. Throughout our history, we have taken both small steps and giant leaps in that pursuit. Our next destination awaits. We don't know what new discoveries lie ahead. But this is the very reason we must go. Before we start our next panel, I want to remind those watching at home, you can ask questions on social media using the hashtag PoundAskNASA, and hopefully we'll be able to answer them here uh, at NASA headquarters in Washington. Human space exploration help, helped address fundamental questions about our place in the universe and the history of our solar system. We are human and we identify with the human experience. Through addressing the challenges related to human space exploration, we expand technologies, create new industries, and help to foster a peaceful connection with other nations. Please welcome Mamta Namaraja, our moderator for this morning's first panel on NASA's plans for human spaceflight. Mamta. Good morning, good morning, and thank you so much for being with us. I hope you're ready for an educational day as you learn about what NASA has in store for our nation as we push new frontiers. Today we have Mr. Bill Gerstenmeier and Dr. Mike Gazarek here to tell you just about that, what we have planned for the future of space. Mr. Bill Gerstenmeier is, the, is currently the Associate Administrator for our Human Exploration and Operations Directorate. In that position, he leads our, our, our agency um, in strategy and direction for all of our human-based exploration programs. So it sounds like a big job, huh? Well, it is, but luckily he brings a storied career from the early days of the space shuttle at, at what was then called the Lewis Research Center to most recently managing the International Sp Space Station program at Johnson Space Center before coming here at headquarters and leading our human-based exploration program. He's an alumnus of Purdue University in aeronautical engineering, and he is certainly somebody who can answer most, if not all, of your questions on human-based exploration. Along with Mr. Gerstenmeier, we have Dr. Mike Gazarek, who is the director of our space technology program. Dr. Gazarek has over 25 years in the engineering industry in our space flight program. He's worked on numerous projects from the Mars Science Laboratory to, and let me make sure I get this right, advanced laser-based rendezvous and docking sensor systems. I had to memorize that, it sounds very intelligent. So besides bringing intelligence to the table, he also has just the knowledge we need to, to learn about the technology it will take to achieve our future, future space flight goals. So what I'd like to do is begin by allowing each of our panelists to give you an introduction and insight into the future of human space flight, and then answer any of those questions that you may have. So Mr. Gerstenmeier, if you can begin by letting us know what the next five to 10 years hold for NASA. 
Okay. I'll, I'll kind of just give you a, a kind of a quick thumbnail sketch of what we're doing and what's moving forward. It's a pretty exciting time in human spaceflight. You know, again, we have, uh, as uh, John said earlier, we have six crew on board the space station today as we sit here. And it's, it's pretty amazing to me to think that every day we've got six folks living, working, doing research on board space station every single day. A lot of their activities are in the science realm, and there'll be a panel later this afternoon that'll talk about those activities. But we also use the space station as kind of a technology and research platform. You know, this week we had a, a media event where we talked about a module we're going to add, essentially an expandable structure that's going to sit on the outside of space station. That's a very unique structure. Typically, our, our modules we live in are large aluminum cans where the... Uh, the, the center piece or down the middle of the activity is open and then all the research equipment is on the outside. When we go to the expandables, there's going to be a keel down the middle and now there's just all this open space and volume on the outside. We think those new modules will be very important to us as we go do exploration. They'll be needed for, for the long distances we're going to travel where we'll be in space for up to years, maybe two, three years. And you really need some large habitable volume. So we'll gain some experience on space station with that, with that type of module. They also work well on surface systems. Um, so that's kind of the first piece of space station. The next piece is we're working on the Orion capsule down in Florida today. Uh, you saw some of the pictures of it in the videos here. We're getting ready for a uh, entry test in 2014, next year. That capsule is now down in Florida getting final outfitting through the remainder of this year. It'll be complete at the end of December of this year, and then it will actually be ready to be taken into space next year in 2014. And the intent of that is we're not going to go anywhere really with the vehicle. We're just going to accelerate it to about 80% of the velocity that we would return from the moon with, and we're going to understand how the heat shield performs and how well it can dissipate heat. So that's a pretty exciting piece of activity that's going on right now down in Florida. That follows with an unmanned or uncrewed uh, test flight in 2017, and then the first crewed flight beyond low Earth orbit somewhere to the vicinity of the moon in 2021. So pretty exciting near-term period with, with that vehicle. That vehicle needs to ride on a new launch system. That's called the Space Launch System. It'll be manufactured in New Orleans. We're in the process of doing a lot of design work and getting that ready to move forward. The other thing that you're starting to see now is you're starting to see a lot of commercial activities occur, both on the cargo delivery to space station and also new vehicles that will take crews to the space station. And we call those commercial or they're coming predominantly from the private sector. So we're acquiring those new capabilities in a different way. So instead of NASA being there kind of hand in hand and guiding and leading the design, the technology is mature enough in low Earth orbit that we can let someone go do that for us, and all we're doing is essentially buying a service. So it's exciting to see a whole group, new group of engineers, new companies come on board to actually deliver services for us. So again, those are the major highlights. I, I look forward to your questions. I think the thing that really drives us at this agency more than anything is we really love a challenge. I think all the folks and the engineers that work with us, they like those problems in the back of the book that it said, this is for extra credit, there's no answer to this problem. These are the things that we thrive on every day. So whether it's a budget challenge, it's a political challenge, it's a technology challenge, whatever that challenge is, I have a team that, that works behind me that I'm willing to give that challenge to, and it's amazing what this agency can accomplish if we just articulate the challenge in a way they can understand. So I'll turn it over to Mike to talk about some technology. Absolutely. If you could give us an idea into the technologies that will be required to achieve these goals Mr. Gerstenmeier spoke about. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to be here, and, and, and thanks. And welcome again, everybody here. Thanks for coming out. Um, so space technology uh, is uh, a, a, a very exciting program this year. Uh, we have over 800 projects that we uh, are engaged in making progress in. And, and what we're working on are the technologies that are needed for future exploration for some of the things that, that, that Bill talked about. Those technologies that are needed, we're working on those today. We're building those, we're testing them, we're in the laboratories uh, trying to figure out and develop and get ready for future mission exploration that can be used in our exploration plans um, so we can go further than we ever have before in space. So we're looking at technologies that will allow us to go above and beyond you know, the, the uh, International Space Station in low Earth orbit. And so we know the, um, there are things that we need to do to go explore that we have to get ready to make sure we understand how they work. Uh, and solve some of the really tough problems that Bill just described. Um, 
The list of challenges you need to explore is pretty interesting. It's, it's pretty much been the same list that's been there since, let's say, early Viking explorers. You know, you need a way to be able to move. We need propulsion. You need to be able to way to stay alive, food, or eat, you know, life environmental systems. You need an ability to communicate um, and send signals back and forth and be able to, to communicate, of course, back to the home base or the crew. And so those kind of are the same basic problems and challenges we've had really, you know, for years. And so those are some of the things we're working on. So, for example, one of the projects we have, uh, very excited, it's, it's based up here at the Goddard Space Flight Center, is to use optical communication, lasers, sending data back and forth um, uh, from space to be able to transmit the data as we go uh, and we'll need that as we go and explore space. You may have seen some of the great images uh, from Mars, from some of the uh, orbiters we have on Mars. You know, the majority of the data, the pictures on Mars, actually remain on Mars. <laughs> we can't get them off the planet and through the bandwidth and, and back here to Earth. And so, and so uh, you know, we don't want to continue, we, we want to, con you know, explore, if you will, the universe with uh, something, let's say, like a cable modem, you know, versus the old dial-up modems, you know, that we had, you know, years ago, for those of you who are old enough to remember the those things. Um, the other thing we're working on is propulsion, right? The ability to, uh, of course, travel the vast distances in space. And uh, one of the ways we're looking at that is actually an exhibit here uh, in the lobby. I hope you get to see it. It's a big, what we call a solar sail. And it's using the sun's energy, the photons from the sun's energy, to capture it in a big sail uh, to be able to move without the need of propellant. Uh, we can use the sun's energy that, then to, to move around in space. Now, you can't move very far and you can't move very fast, but for a lot of applications, especially those that are looking at the solar weather, uh, when we look at the sun and the type of uh, energy and weather it, it, uh, it spews that out us, uh, a mission like that that needs to stay in one place for a long period of time, great, great application for something like a solar sail. We cover a lot of things in space technology. One of the ones that uh, Charlie mentioned is going to be that demonstration of exoskeleton. Uh, this, uh, you know, it's real Iron Man-like stuff. I, I had the, uh, the luxury to put on some of the hardware when I was at Johnson Space Center just a, just a few weeks ago. Uh, and, and, you know, you can strap it on and, and uh, just kind of, kind of like the movie. But it's, it's fantastic work allowing robotics and humans to interact. Um, and as Charlie mentioned, great applications both for astronauts and, of course, for here, here on Earth. Um, in addition to that, you may have seen on the International Space Station R2. He's a, a robot, humanoid robot. You may have seen him work in the presence of the crew. That, that's another great example of robotics in the presence of humans. And that uh, started also at the Johnson Space Center in a partnership with General Motors. Both, if you may have seen robotics in uh, automotive manufacturing uh, plants, you notice there's not a lot of humans around those typically because they can kill you. <laughs> uh, they're big, they're powerful, right? They move fast. Well, the idea, you know, the astronauts get a little nervous about that. Uh, on the International Space Station, and so we obviously we prefer a robotic that can detect your presence, that can understand you're there and work in safe proximity to astronauts. So, in so we have tough problems to solve as we, we go to space. We know it's a really, really hard and challenging environment. We have some of the toughest problems there are in the nation, and so that's what the Space Tech Program is about, is going and tackling those problems. And one of the ways we do that uh, is not only the NASA workforce, and talented as, as it is, but we're also reaching out to universities to the nation's brightest and best. And we now have engaged over 100 universities in 350 activities in space technology as we engage them you know, on the problems we need to solve for NASA and, and really some of the problems we have for the nation. So that's a great year in space technology. And again, too, I'll, I'll be glad to talk more about it uh, as we go forward this morning. Absolutely. If I could take all of the time with you, I would. But instead, we'll open up the questions to the audience. I'm sure you have uh, many thoughts you'd like to ask our panel members today. So if anybody has a question, just raise your hand real high so our mic handlers can see you. And we'll wait for the microphones to come to you so our audience at home can also hear the questions. So I've read a fair amount about uh, electric propulsion as opposed to chemical. Um, and it sounds really exciting. What do you think for deep space, deep space exploration? Is it going to be chemical? Is it going to be electrical? Yeah, we can, we'll both kind of answer that. I would tell you from a, from a human standpoint and when we're going these long distances, electric propulsion is really the way to go um, to carry the amount of propellant and stored in chemical fashion versus electrical is just weight prohibitive. So I think we're definitely heading towards electric propulsion. And, and Mike can give you some details of the activities that they've got planned in that area. Yeah, great, great question. And just like Bill said, so that's one of the, the needs that the mission has. And so in space technology, we're working on that today. 
We think solar electric propulsion has great benefits, um, not only for space, but there's a whole variety of uh, interests by the commercial industry, uh, satellite communication providers, other government agencies, all interested in solar electric propulsion. So this is the idea that you know, instead of chemical, as you say, right, you can use sun's energy, solar arrays, collect that energy, and then use uh, high charged particles, ions, if you will, off the back of the thruster to be able to move. Now, it's not a lot of thrust. <laughs> it's really slow, but it's continuous. You know, when we go to Mars, for example, we get a kick from a chemical and then we coast and then use gravity, of course, you know, to, to, to steer us and navigate where we want to go. With solar electric propulsion, right, you can con have that continuous thrust. What we see today in the world of solar electric propulsion, there, there's, there's plenty of examples of it today you can find in many satellites, but to get to high power levels, you need bigger arrays. Our ability to collect the sun's energy and the solar rays, many of you have seen those, right, on terrestrial homes and roofs. Well, we use the same kind of arrays in space modified, of course, for that harsh environment, but we need bigger arrays. We've got to collect more of the sun's energy. And so it's kind of a, right now, it's a, the big challenge is in that structural and thermal. How do you deploy this 100 foot or longer type array and how do you keep it stable? How do you control it? And so that's some of the technology work we're doing today. <clears throat> so uh, give us a summary of what you would see the, the top three technology areas uh, specific projects. So, for example, the solar sail being one, but what are some of the other ones? Right, so we, uh, it's an interesting question about technology. One of the things is where do you invest technology? It's been uh, any, any technology program always faces this challenge. You know, where do you, you can often view it as an investment, right? Where do you, because we need some lead time, we have to get some technology ready. And so, how do you place your bets, make your investments, if you will? What problems do we solve? Well, one of the ways we figure that out, right, is by one, we ask our customer, <laughs> what do you need? And uh, we got a good, strong list uh, from Bill. The other thing we did is we, we turned outside to the National Academies of Science, and we asked expert teams from across the country to, to develop roadmaps in these technical areas. So that's the framework of, of the answer. And the answer to that, especially for human spaceflight, uh, early architecture studies have said a couple things. One, one big area is in propulsion. So uh, in the chemical side, it's cryogenic propellant storage. So in the use of chemicals, we want to use cryogens. Uh, to store these, you know, you might have seen liquid nitrogen. If any of the kids have been into a science lab, you put a banana in a liquid nitrogen, you know, and freeze. All right, so those really, really cold liquids, right, are, are what we need, you know, for rocket propulsion. Well, we got to store them, and they boil off. In today's state of the art, uh, maybe they last in the upper stage of about nine hours. And for what we see for future exploration, we need to turn that into nine months. And so how do you go do that? So cryogenic propellant storage and transfer is one of the challenges. The second one is solar electric propulsion. You know, we, we talked about that earlier. So those are, I'd say, two of our top two. The third one, you know, you can kind of debate depending on what team you ask, uh, but probably would be in optical communication, or especially for the high rate video and the images that we need, our ability, like I said, mentioned earlier, to transmit that data is a big challenge. And so those are three as an example of our, of our, our big projects. And if you could also introduce yourself, if you could give us your name, that would be great. Oh, Hi, I'm Aiden, and I have a question. Since there's seven robonauts on the space station, are there more boys or more girls? Let's <laughs> <laughs> see. Right now, the crew. <laughs> you know, right, it, tell, right? Yeah, right now, I'm going through all their names. <laughs> it, it, so, so right now, they're all they're all boys, and and but we have two robots on board space station, at least two. We have we have robonaut on the inside that Mike talked about. Then on the outside, as we sit here today, there's a robot on the outside, a Canadian robot called Dexter. And it looks a lot like the robot you would see in an industrial machine plant that actually builds cars. You know, it's an industrial robot with big hunky arms and a fancy little gripper at the end. And so, so the joke kind of we have is that Robonaut are, is, is very, looks like a human, has dexterous hands and fingers, whereas Dexter on the outside, or this, the, uh, the Canadian robot, it just has a machine interface. So we say the robot on the outside really has a face that only an engineer can love. <laughs> so, so you can relate to Robonaut because it looks humanoid. You, you can't relate quite as well to the external robot that's on the outside. And right today, as we sit here, it's actually doing a task on board space station to look at going up to a spacecraft and removing a, a, a propellant fill valve 
that was never meant to be serviced in space. It's demonstrating whether you can actually do that remotely from the ground, remove that, the open the valve up, and actually transfer propellant into a spacecraft. So we're actually demonstrating that we can refuel a spacecraft in space with the, with the Canadian robot on the outside of Space Station today as we sit here today. So pretty exciting activities, not only from the human standpoint on board station, but also the robot portion on station. But I guess I guess the one question we didn't answer is R2, you know, is it a boy or a girl? I, 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 I have to go I back to Rob Ambrose and ask him. I don't, I don't know. know. Maybe we should have a, a yeah, yeah, that's a good question. We need to go look at that. Why don't we have a female-oriented robot? That's a good question. Aiden, you've given them something to think yeah, about. Yeah, I'm going to take that one back. I didn't you think I'd get proud. an action out of this, but I think I, uh, I think I, <laughs> give me work. That's great. I, do we have any other questions on this side? And if you could also tell us where you're from in addition to your name. I'm Hannah. I'm from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, so I know the SLS is in progress right now, but how close do you think we are to uh, building a launch system outside of low Earth orbit? Yeah, I, I mean, SLS is designed to really take crews beyond low Earth orbit. It, it starts out to lift uh, roughly, uh, you know, 70 metric tons to low Earth orbit. So it's, it's really designed to carry large pieces of hardware. And then it can grow and get bigger as, as we progress. And so it'll eventually get to where it can carry about 130 metric tons. And then at that point, it can actually, we'll need actually, we think, six or seven launches to actually take the amount of cargo and supplies to take a crew to the surface of Mars. So when you go out here and you look at the space station mock-up and you look at that picture where it's over top of a football field, it weighs roughly 900,000 pounds in orbit. We think it'll take a roughly 900,000 pounds of equipment, gear, propellant, food, supplies, and crew to get to the surface of Mars. So roughly what you see out there on the, in the space station size is what we'll need to go to Mars. And we want to do that in fewer number of flights than it took to build the space station. She's got a clarification. Oh, a clarification. Okay. Um, I was asking about building it outside of low Earth oh, orbit. Building. Oh. Oh. Well, you know, Mike is kind of looking at one piece he's, we're looking at is cryogenic propellant storage, where we can keep these super cold fluids or keep these yeah, propellants cold so they don't all boil off. So we're looking potentially at storing some of that in some regions, and then we might not actually build or assemble the, the rocket there, but we will definitely be able to refuel it to go some other places. We also need to start thinking about can we use like the, the regolith on the, the, on the surface of the moon? Can we use that material from the moon as a, as a material that we might actually build or fabricate spacecraft out of? The first thing may be is it may be used to provide radiation shielding for, for crews that are on the surface of the moon. We may look at building one of these inflatable modules that I, that I discussed to you earlier. We may actually put that on the surface of the moon. And then we would essentially use astronauts or use some type of robotic device to put lunar soil over the top of that so it provides shielding of the radiation that's coming in from deep space. So we'll do a lot of things, I think, starting to build there. But, but that's something we need to start thinking about. As you go further and further, you're going to have to build stuff where you start from. Where you start. As you guys, I add to that too, you know, we talked about all the mass that we talked about to go to another surface. The other, probably maybe the fourth area, the big area for us is our ability to actually slow down. So enough with all the propulsion stuff, what about our ability to slow down? So hopefully many of you were able to watch the Curiosity landing in August this, this month. I hope see some, yeah, 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 yeah that's right, right. We, I agree. We have a, a video clip of that landing, by the way. There's many out there. Not, every time I show it and use it in a talk, I mean, I still get goose pimples, you know, about that. And so that's a metric ton on the surface of Mars, and that's the most we can do. Uh, we can't slow down fast enough. You know, Mars has a really, frankly, poor atmosphere, <laughs> a poor excuse for an atmosphere. It's just enough that you can't ignore it, uh, but it doesn't really help you slow down very much. And so we're working on better ways, well, to slow down. And, and they often involve in, in what one of the, our latest ideas are inflatable technologies. You know, inflate a, an inner tube, if you will, a big disc, an umbrella, uh, looking device uh, that enables you to, you know, fly through those really, really fast speeds, you know, thousands of, of kilometers, you know, per second as you come through that, that atmosphere and, and kind of slow down and, and take the heat and all the aerodynamic dynamic lows. And we think that's one of the ways, once we build some of these things we're talking about, we can then get to the surface of another planet. That's fantastic. I think we have a question over here. Uh, Bob Kowalczyk from College Park, Maryland. It's about the solar paneling the structure and, and also the quality. We've had gallium arsenide and we've had silicon and I think the figures are about 14, 15, 20 percent 
effective. What kind of effectivity have we improved on for Orion? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have the specific numbers for Orion. Uh, when you go out in the lobby and you take a look at Orion, I'll tell you a secret. You see those nice uh, round solar rays that are out there? We just made a deal the other day with the Europeans to have them build the service module. That's a little piece that sits behind Orion. You're now going to see arrays that now stick out in panels, not no longer the round arrays. So you're going to see a different change there. But I don't know the specific efficiency. Maybe we can get one of our folks to get that, that data for you. Yeah, I know on advanced technology, we're, we're looking at trying to get efficiencies maybe as high as up to close to 30 percent. But you know, it's still in early stages of whether or not we can do that or not. Um, and, and we're looking at things as concentrators is another example, too, the ability to try to focus as much sunlight as we can. But again, those are in early stages, not ready for spaceflight. But it is a, it is a top problem. And I believe we have a question from our social media platforms. We do. We have a question from Twitter. At JP Major asks, will there really be a crewed Orion moon mission in 2021, landing or orbital? It'll be an orbital, <clears throat> probably some type of orbital mission in 2021 with a crew of four. That's very exciting. Very exciting. Let's see if I can track one of our mic handlers. We'll go with this young lady in the front. Oh, sorry. Good morning, Carrie DeFreyas from San Diego. Um, lots been going on in the past couple of years. I was fortunate enough to attend uh, 135 NASA tweet up, and then today, and I was also, I was also here at headquarters for the um, Curiosity landing. Oh, cool. So I'd love to hear from you guys. What has excited or delighted you the most in the past couple of years uh, regarding NASA and your jobs? Wow. I don't know. A you, meeting it. I have one. If you, you yeah, want you to, you start. That's a great question. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that one made us think. Um, I, I, well, for me, uh, and I miss, this may sound kind of corny, but it, it is really, it is really true. It is the people. So we do a lot of investments in technology, and we talked a lot about all these different applications. But when you go out into the field and meet some of the folks that are working on what we're doing in the lab, in the test field, um, uh, it's it's incredible to see the passion and their energy of what they want to go do and how to accomplish. You know, and at the end of the day, it really is an investment of in people. Even in the technology, the history of technology has shown it really is about a community of innovators, right, talking to each other. Often technical leaps occur in history of leaps and bounds. It's not a very linear process at all. And so part of space tech, for example, is building that community. So for me, when I, when I go out to the field and meet some of the folks and see what they're doing, I, it, to be, my job is really to enable that. I, I don't really get to do anything anymore, right? You know, um, spread, you know spreadsheets and sound bites. But I, but I can enable that, right? And that's what I, for me, is, is what I take something away from. Did that give you enough time? Yep. <laughs> and, and so what I would say is that uh, when I get a chance to get up in the morning or the evening and you know you can now get the app that will tell you when space station is flying overhead yeah, I and I get a chance to watch this little white thing go across the sky and you can look at the model out there and see how big it is and then if I drag my neighbors out I bring pictures of the crew that are on orbit at the same time so then I show my neighbors these six folks are on board the space station on that little white dot going overhead. I think about the amount of effort that went in to build that, the number of shuttle flights, the number of spacewalks, you know, I think on the order of four months of spacewalks on the outside to actually build that thing. Built from an international partner community of 16 countries, we're all working together to make that happen. And then know we're actually getting really productive research out of that facility is pretty amazing to me. So you get a chance to see all your hard work actually fly over in the morning or evening and that's pretty special when you get to go see that. And I'd like to take a hack at that question as well. One of my favorite things about working for NASA is being able to talk to the Aidens of the world, being able to go out to classrooms or Skype into classrooms and tell them how exciting our jobs are and then see it reflected back in their excitement. That's probably, and I'd say most of us who have done that would say that's one of the best highlights of working for NASA. We have another question here. Thanks. <clears throat> Jeff Wallace, Arlington, Virginia. Uh, one of the uh, things I heard about the, the NASA JPL tweet up where we primarily learned, uh, were the last people to see Curiosity before it all got all boxed up, which was great, uh, was to hear about the NASA Dawn spacecraft and how that was in many regards the first spacecraft that had a true ion propulsion system. And I just you know, haven't heard enough about that because I think that's such a cool thing, right? Whenever they introduced it, uh, they you know, showed a picture of the TIE fighter from Star Wars and said, hey, here's the first one like that. So could you say a little bit more about the success or how that's all been perceived, how that went? I don't, I don't know much. 
That's a great. Uh, that's a great point. You're right. Dawn. Dawn was a, a spacecraft that uh, uh, visited. Uh, and I don't remember the Vesta. name now. Vesta. Vesta. Thank you. Uh, 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 and used solar electric propulsion, as you say, and it was one of the first pushes in solar electric propulsion technology, and to be able to count on it and rely on it. And uh, that that you know that we're taking that power level, which I think was uh, maybe two two and a half kilowatts. <laughs> You know, we're trying now to go to five kilowatts, and then it, we're working on thrusters to ten. So really, all we're doing is taking that knowledge right and trying to get larger power levels. But absolutely right. You know, visiting an asteroid, right? Uh, uh, visiting uh, and using solar electric propulsion is a great mission. Uh, John Grunsfeld, who's the head of the science mission directorate, I think will be uh, on a panel later today too, and he, he can probably give you more details on that from the science mission directorate. But gr a great mission, and really you know pioneered the way, and it's some of the great kind of work you know that the agency gets to do. We have a question back here. Hi, thank you. I'm Elizabeth Wallace. I'm from Tacoma Park, Maryland. One of the things that's, uh, actually, I've only recently got in, in, interested in NASA. <laughs> but one of the things I love is, is going back into the history and, and hearing about Apollo 11 and, and how everybody in the world, when they did the tour, said, we did it. And when the astronauts from the ISS come back and they say, well, it was the international corporation that really they remember the most. And you did mention that the um, Orion, we do have a European partner for that. Can you tell us a little bit more about how this is an international effort and how we can really, we have a different funding process here than European Space Agency depends on and other agencies that we partner with. And how can you help to make sure that we don't disappoint them in the future? <laughs> well, it's, it, you, boy, you characterized it really well. I, you know, I, I grew up here in the U.S. and I speak one language, except unless you count math, then I maybe speak two languages. So I feel really, uh, it's amazing when I go to international forums and I, and I interact with my counterparts from Europe and they speak four or five different languages. Uh, I've been exposed to many different cultures. I've got to work hand in hand with the Russians and the Russian Space Agency. Um, you know, I was over there for a year. I actually lived with them in their control center, I actually operated on console with them hand in hand for a year. So we really have really kind of transcended our own cultural bounds, our own international bounds, and we really are reaching for that higher, that challenge. And it really requires all of us to work together. And it's really neat to see that interdependence. You know, at first you can kind of cooperate and not really be dependent on each other. But at this point in time, right while we're building, the, the commercial crew capability comes online, we're using the Russian Soyuz to transport our crews to and from space station. So here we are, totally dependent upon the Russians for our crew transport. We work with them hand in hand. They, we trust our crews to them. I'll go meet with the technicians in Russia. The first words the technicians will usually tell me is, I'm doing my job exactly right so you don't have to worry about your crew. So here's an amazing discussion of myself with a technician that doesn't even speak, or maybe speaks a little English, speaks mostly Russian, but his first thing is to make sure that he knows that he's conveyed to me that our crews will be taken care of. So to be able to operate and count on each other like that is just phenomenal. So we need to talk much more about that. I believe as we go do exploration and we do these bigger tasks, we're not going to be able to do them as a single nation. We're going to have to do them in a cooperative manner. And, and it's just, it's amazing. When you think about that space station, many components came from different countries. Some systems were designed with metric units. They're designed in English units. We had to make all those interfaces all work. We plugged them all together many times for the first time in space and somehow it all worked. So it's, it's a pretty testament, a pretty strong testimony that we can all work together. And the last point I would say is, you know, we often talk about the hardware, at least as an engineer, but I honestly believe it's really the people that, that really make all this stuff happen. And, and that's really what drives this agency and drives us to do these things, is working together as a team and, and really trying to, to know that it cannot be accomplished as an individual. It has to be a true team effort. We'll take a question from here. Uh, hi, I'm Ching Yu from Damascus, Maryland. Uh, my question is more towards the life aspect of it, uh, like long-term you know, space travel, like going to Mars, for example. And have, have you guys done any exploratory work on, you know, having supplies, long-term supplies for crew? And what's your comment on Mars One? We're doing a lot of things to uh, to, to look at that right now. We've 
We've done some things where we're looking at, uh, uh, at pharmaceutical storage. If you think about it, if you're going to go someplace for three years, can the drugs you want to take with you, will they degrade in space? Will they be handled differently? So we've been doing some studies along those lines. Um, in 2015, we're going to actually have a crew that will stay on board the space station for one year. A U.S. and a Russian crew member will actually live on space station for a year. So that'll be intriguing to see if there's anything there that changes. The Russians have done it before. They've flown crews, uh, you know, almost a year, slightly beyond a year. So it's not that you can't do it, but we really want to now take the the new investigation tools we've got and see how the physical body changes over time. We know very well how the body changes in space. When you go to space, uh, one thing that occurs is your immune system doesn't work as effectively as it does on the ground. There's bone loss that occurs. There's lots of physiological changes that occur as you go into space. We have it characterized very well how that lasts for this for the six month period, but we don't know much beyond the six month period, so we're going to go experiment with that. So it'll be very interesting to see how we can use the space station to do that. We also need life support systems, the systems that generate the oxygen and remove the carbon dioxide. Those systems have to operate now for essentially for three or four years. On board space station, maybe they work for about a month, and then we've got to change something out, something doesn't work exactly right. So we've got a lot of technology that we've got to do in life support systems to get a very low maintenance system that we can go operate. The other big thing is also uh, resupply stuff. You know, we recycle almost everything on board space station. The urine gets recycled as you sweat or perspire. That gets recycled back into the system, and you get to drink that again as a crew member. So we don't do that at NASA headquarters. So, right? So please. Yeah, we yeah. test for that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we all tested for that. <laughs> and uh, but anyway, so but it's an interesting and intriguing thing to make sure that how do we really do? You talk about green systems here on the ground, right? How do you make an efficient house or an efficient building the most efficient things we can do are really on the space station we're trying to recycle repurpose reuse everything on board station so it's it's neat that we're actually solving problems in space that have benefit us here and and on the cruise pen I always wear the the crew that's flying pin on my lapel and, and I do that so I know why I really work and I'm working for those six folks on orbit and on the bottom of their pin they have a nice little statement it says off the earth for the earth and that is such a cool statement that they've committed their lives to take six months and probably two years worth of training to be away from their families for, to do this research in space, but they're doing it for benefit of us here on the Earth. So what a tremendous testimony to their statement that they carry on their pen that is, that is pretty amazing and, and what, what it's really all about. And they're willing to do it even with recycled urine. Yes. yes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I think we have time for one more question. We'll take it right here. Hi, I'm Angela Gibson, Aiden's mom, <laughs> and I'm from Hampton, Virginia area near NASA Langley, and you were talking about the environmental and life support issues uh, for long-term space exploration. I know that Astro Wheels, Doug Wetlock, um, was on the space station for a very long time, and when he talked to us at the MSL Mars Curiosity launch, he talked about how his eyesight was something that was being researched and that it was a long-term study. Is that still happening, and are there other things that other astronauts are participating in when it comes to the anatomy and physiology of humans and astronauts? Yep, there, there, there sure is. There's lots of studies going on. That's one of the emerging problems that we didn't even know we had, is that, that your, eyes, your eyesight actually changes, the fluid shifts, and the pressure in your brain actually increases a little bit. It causes the eye to deform, and it can actually cause the retina to actually move or get folds in the back of your eye. Um, it, most times it always recovers upon return, but this is a new phenomenon we didn't really perceive until we started flying these longer durations. So now we're trying to understand what really causes that. Is it j It's more than a fluid shift because it appears to be there um, even after flight. The other thing that we're looking at right now is we're, we're looking at the, the human spine. If you want to get taller, you can go to space. You'll, you'll grow about two to three inches once you get in space when there's no gravity loading on your spine. So, you know, if you've always wanted to be taller, you need to go sign up to be an astronaut and you can grow taller, but except it goes away. When you come back, you shrink right back down to your normal size. But we're looking now at how the spine changes. So we're using ultrasound now to actually ultrasound the, the spines of our astronauts on orbit to see how the vertebrae actually move, to see where the elongation occurs, and to see if there's any kind of thing 
things that could be problematic if you're exposed to that for a long duration. What's intriguing about that is on in terrestrial applications, if you have a back problem, you would typically always go get an x-ray. They would never typically use ultrasound. But we don't have an x-ray device on station, so we had no choice but to use ultrasound. Now, we NASA are starting to use ultrasound. We expose that to the medical community, and they go, oh, hey, maybe we ought to be trying this. So now I'm starting to see hospitals and clinics start to pick up using ultrasound now as a diagnostic tool for backs. It'll still be predominantly x-ray, but you're starting to see now because we had to do it a different way. We exposed them to thinking in a different manner. So that's one of the benefits that comes from space and, and pushing into a new environment. It's like when you go on vacation to a foreign location, right? You learn something more about yourself by going and putting yourself in that different environment. By going to space, we're going to learn more about how the human body really functions by forcing it and seeing how it adapts to that new environment. So it, the medical and biological changes in space are really intriguing and, and will spawn a lot of research, again, that will help us down here. So I think one thing is clear, we have many challenges left, but certainly we have many things that we're working towards for the future of human spaceflight. I'd like to thank our panelists, Mr. Gerstenmeier and Dr. Gazarek, for being with us today and answering our questions on the future of human spaceflight. Thank you. Everyone knows that NASA works hard to keep its astronauts safe in space. But did you know that spin-offs from space technology are saving lives here on Earth every day? NASA-funded research created rocket-powered parachutes that can save entire airplanes along with their pilots and passengers. A life raft, originally designed for the Apollo missions, has saved hundreds of sailors stranded at sea and a tiny cardiac pump developed with the help of technology used to design rocket engines has extended the lives of hundreds of patients with failing hearts. NASA's innovation even led to personal locator beacons, which have helped save more than 30,000 sailors, pilots, and adventurers in distress worldwide. Together with its partners, NASA continues to develop technologies that protect life both in space and on Earth. There's more space in your life than you think. Learn more at nasa.gov. That was Will Wheaton. As some of you know, was was famous for Star Trek. You know, Will and some other folks have been connecting with us on social media. Um, that's been a real good venue for us, just to connect directly with the public. So remember to follow us on at NASA if you want to learn more about what we're doing as an agency. Also, for today's event, if you want to ask us a question, the hashtag is pound ask NASA. We're also streaming this on YouTube, on Ustream, excuse me. And the uh, URL for that is www.ustream.tv slash NASA HDTV. Follow along and ask a question. Investments in aviation and space technology and innovation enable new missions, stimulate the economy, contribute to the nation's global competitive, competitiveness, and inspire Americans' next generation of scientists, engineers, and astronauts. Nearly every aircraft today has a NASA-supported technology on board that helps the vehicle fly more safely and efficiently. From improved welding techniques that help manufacturers weld higher strength alloys, to flame retardant materials that help first responders keep safe during emergencies. Technological advances first used to send astronauts and robots to space are improving technologies and processes here on Earth. Our panel moderator, Jennifer Gustetic, from the Office of Chief Technologist, will introduce our next panel, who will talk more about innovation technology and improving the economy and the space program. Jennifer? Hello, good morning. I'm really pleased to be here this morning to introduce a great panel that's going to talk to you a bit today about uh, the benefits of NASA technology on each of y'all's lives every day. So um, get ready to ask some good questions about maybe unexpected NASA technology that you see every day in your life. Um, we've got Mason Peck with us today, as well as Jaywon Shin. Mason Peck is my boss. He's the chief technologist uh, for NASA. He's, uh, and in that capacity, he acts as the agency's principal advisor and advocate on matters concerning technology policy and programs. 
He actually, before coming to NASA, um, has been a faculty member at Cornell uh, for many years, focusing on a variety of uh, small spacecraft topics. Um, he spent 20 years in industry and academia, um, as well as having authored 90 academic articles, and about he holds about 17 patents. That's a lot of innovation himself. Um, he holds a PhD from UL, uh, UCLA in aerospace engineering, as well as um, a master's in medieval uh, English literature from the University of Chicago. So Mason is a diverse boss, and in addition to uh, being an expert in medieval English literature, he also uh, is really passionate about baking, which I find very interesting, um, especially because of its its science elements as well. Um, and he also speaks uh, he also speaks fluent Japanese. So a little bit about Mason, um, not just as a rocket scientist, but also as a person. Um, moving on to uh, Dr. J. Wan Shin. Dr. J. Wan Shin is the Associate Administrator for the Aeronautics Research and Mission, Direc Mission Directorate here uh, at NASA. Um, and in that capacity, he manages the agency's uh, aeronautics research portfolio and guides its strategic direction. He's had a long history here at NASA, and prior to having this role, he used to see, uh, serve as the Chief of Aeronautics Projects at, the, at NASA Glenn uh, Research Center, which is up in Cleveland, Ohio, where I was born. He received his PhD in mechanical engineering from Virginia Polytechnic Institute um, in Blacksburg, Virginia. Um, and he has a, a bunch of awards uh, from NASA, ranging from the uh, NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal to the 2008 Presidential Rank Award. So he's truly a great public servant who we have here on this panel today. And he as well uh, is very smart, obviously, and has co-authored more than 20 technical and journal papers uh, as well. But he's not all about business. He also likes to have fun. Um, and uh, he, one of his, his fun facts is that he can't fly a fighter jet, but he does like to drive fast cars. Um, so segueing into uh, a, a short video that the aeronautics folks would like to show you guys real quick, um, I know a question that Dr. Shin will have for you later is, did you know NASA is with you when you fly? So we'll go ahead and start taking questions from the audience. I can start them off with one while we, uh, while we get them ginned up. I'm interested, from y'all's perspective, which spin-off technology you think is the most unexpected that folks in this audience and, and watching uh, online might not know is actually a NASA technology. Mason? Uh, well, let's see. I guess uh, one of my favorites, because it's so unexpected, is um, baby food. So it turns <laughs> out that there's a a compound that's used in 90-95% of baby food worldwide. Uh, it was developed originally for astronaut nutrition out of algae, believe it or not. Uh, but our research into that uh, created this, uh, created an understanding of how we could in fact promote brain growth and nervous system development in infants. And uh, that's had a huge impact worldwide. So it's, you know, it's evidence of what we were talking about that uh, really when we invest in space, we are not spending that money in space, we spend it here on the ground. You know, we don't dump shovelfuls of cash onto the moon. We are, we are in fact, uh, promoting American innovation and growing our economy. And these, uh, these kinds of benefits, whether it's baby food or some of the things you heard about in Will Wheaton's talk, uh, really um, are infused within our lives. I, I think it'd be hard to imagine a world without NASA, whether you're, whether you're an infant drinking formula or, uh, or older. I, I think it's, it's true. How about you? Yeah. Um while uh, our friends and colleagues in the space side uh, of this wonderful agency have been doing some really amazing stuff. Uh, by the way, stuff is a technical term. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I mean, I just cannot imagine uh, what wonderful things uh, uh, space side of the agency uh, has done. Um, but 
uh, in the aeronautics side, everything we do uh, is a direct benefit to all of us, to flying public. There is nothing that we need to uh, uh, spin off or regenerate or, or uh, morph to benefit you. So, um, you know, I always start asking the audience uh, when it, whenever I engage with the public, um, how many of you at least flown once uh, last year? Virtually everyone in the room. So that, that's the testimony. Se several decades ago, uh, flying was somewhat uh, novelty that uh, you, you had to have a pretty good uh, resource means to fly, and it's not everyday transportation. But nowadays, if you go to airport, uh, any airport, busy airport, it, it's like um, uh, what used to be Greyhound uh, bus station. And um, I, I'll throw some a few numbers uh, just to uh, share some information that um, our nation employs about 10 million people uh, in aviation-related industry. And um, our commercial airlines spent about $60 billion for fuel only last year. That's six zero. <laughs> and it's not M, it's B. So um, it, it's a huge industry. And um, if you fly uh, randomly once every day, uh, the, the possibility or probability of you getting into fatal accident is, is so low that you have to fly about uh, 20,000 years. And we all know we're not going to live that long. So. <laughs> uh, it is extremely safe. In fact, it's the safest mode of uh, transportation uh, anywhere. Um, and our country is at the uh, forefront of this industry. So. The reason why I'm, I'm uh, explaining all this is, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, NASA Aeronautics is, is the DNA of uh, almost all modern uh, commercial aircraft for sure, but many uh, military aircraft as well. And uh, we are the world leader. Uh, there's no dispute about that. And um, I think uh, uh, NASA Aeronautics has done tremendous contribution and service to the nation that we all benefit. Um, we are not stopping here. Uh, we have exciting uh, future and uh, new technology that, that we've been working on, as we have always been. So uh, unmanned aerial vehicle uh, that, you know, who knows, uh, 20 years later, when this young uh, uh, boy and girl growing up to our age, they may be ordering a pizza at home, and uh, UAS will drop a pizza <laughs> <laughs> to your, your doorstep. Uh, who knows? Uh, and uh, we are working on also very different uh, uh, airplane configuration. Um, uh, shape of the airplane is completely different. So uh, in 20 years, uh, we may be flying in a completely different looking airplane than uh, what we call tube and wing. Um, to save uh, uh, fuel consumption. So um, we, we're very excited about uh, providing the direct benefit mm -hmm. to the flying public and um, along with the uh, uh, space side of the agency that also provides a tremendous value to the country through all kinds of technologies. We are very proud to be part of the uh, Thank you, Dr. Shin. And before we get into the questions, Mason, is there anything you want to add generally about technology at the agency and all of the spin-off work and all of the good work that we do in infusing technology into the nation? Well, there's so much we could say. I, I'll tell you, I could, I could geek out forever over the awesome things that NASA does, uh, certainly uh, to benefit the nation, but also just in space generally and, and in aeronautics. Um, I'll tell you, I don't know about you, it does feel like once a day I am flying, flying randomly somewhere. Uh, that's, that's one of the uh, things we do here. We, we do reach out at NASA. Uh, and something that I think is also not commonly understood is the extent to which NASA works with businesses, small uh, and large, also even individuals, uh, to make our future in space and, and air possible. Uh, we do do a lot of fantastic research within NASA, but we also engage with universities, small businesses, large businesses. Uh, we also have international partners where we work on hard problems. When we set these difficult uh, goals for ourselves, uh, sending astronauts to rendezvous with an asteroid and someday to Mars, uh, when we set those difficult goals, uh, we're trying to reach for something extraordinary. In the process, though, we learn so many new things. It's because we set these hard goals for ourselves, because we challenge ourselves, that we're able to grow um, as a nation and also 
uh, as, uh, as an agency, of course, in our ability to solve hard problems. So uh, even if you're not a space nut like I am or, or an aeronautics nut like I am or, or like Giant One is, you know, the fact is um, you should be interested in the hard problems, the, the difficulty that we're challenging ourselves with. Um, it's, it's one of the things that makes us unique, I think, as a nation, certainly as, as NASA. Um, but it's those hard problems that really are why we have the solutions that we have today. I'll mention cell phone cameras just because why not, right? Um, you, you know, the, the CMOS camera that's in your cell phone, uh, that's actually based on technology developed at the Jet Propulsion Lab, the folks who brought you the Mars Science Laboratory uh, that uh, landed so successfully this past August. Um, you know, probably most, let's see hands, who's got a cell phone in there? Uh, possession right now. Yeah. I thought maybe that would be the case. I'm surprised that not everyone in this room raised a hand, but um, you know, maybe maybe you two kids uh, don't have your own cell phones. Yet. <laughs> so I mean, the the pervasiveness of NASA technology is everywhere, and the reason why the cell phone camera uh, became popular, of course, was because there's a uh, there's a motivation, a business case to be made uh, for using phones, using imagery for all sorts of purposes. Uh, it doesn't have to be you know serious scientific exploration in order for it to be valuable for the economy. Uh, so anyway, NASA does reach out. We have programs now, uh, thanks to the Space Technology Program in part, uh, that can engage with technology students at universities, providing grants to them, also for faculty. Uh, we have ways of engaging with uh, small companies, also universities and large companies, to launch uh, small satellites. And I'll go off riff, riff on that a little bit later, but uh, you know, these days it's not unheard of that universities, even some high school students, can launch spacecraft the size of a, a grapefruit. Uh, they're called CubeSats. And uh, we have a program at NASA that can launch them for free for universities. So it's, it's a great time to be engaged in space and in aeronautics. Uh, there's never been a more exciting time, in my view, to be working on these kinds of problems. Great. So let's go to the first question. Here you go. Jeff Wallace, Marlington, Virginia, Rockman 528 on Twitter. I was fortunate enough to see you speak at the NASA Veda Innovative Advanced Concept Symposium this last fall. and just throw you a softball out there to, to talk a little bit about that, tell people about that, and to know what were some of the, the uh, really great things or the things that interested you personally that came out of this year's uh, new projects. A great question. So the, the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program is part of the overall space technology program. Uh, it's our, uh, our focus on these very far out ideas, far out in time. Uh, at least a decade in the future, maybe 20 or even 30 years into the future, we're trying to seed our technology pipeline with ideas that will make sense for us in the decades to come. Uh, they've got to be based on real physics. Uh, at the moment, we are not pursuing warp drives. We're not pursuing uh, transporter beams. Uh, but if the physics enables that, NIAC would be the place where that would happen. Uh, anyway, NIAC, uh, fantastic program. A lot of great ideas have come out of this thing over the years. Uh, in the recent past, one of my favorites I think folks will resonate with is based on 3D printing or what they call additive manufacturing. Uh, you know, now it's actually not that difficult to buy a machine that will allow you to print three-dimensional objects from your home computer. In fact, you can build your own if you really want to. Uh, those 3D printers, uh, imagine a time when we could launch a large 3D printer and use lunar soil or regolith to print up structures on the surface of the moon. Uh, one of the NIA projects this past year actually looked into what that would take. And although we don't have the technology yet, uh, we've now, uh, thanks to that project, uh, we've, uh, we, we think we understand the path to get from here to there. So these ideas that are now informing how we live every day, 3D printers to make some things easy, uh, even the kinds of communications and computational capability in cell phones, uh, this is finding its way into NASA. We talk about spin-offs a lot, but there's also a spin-in phenomenon where we're reaching out and bringing in technology that's been developed for, for folks like you for us to use to motivate new kinds of exploration in space and new kinds of aeronautics. Great. Next question. You go ahead, and then I'll repeat it. Oh, okay. Uh, Jamie Rich, Jimmer3294 on Twitter. Mr. Shin, you were mentioning just how much fuel aircraft go through, like gillions of gallons. Um, the question to, to me is, are we doing research into how that kind of usage also affects our environment and how we can maybe ameliorate some of those effects? So I'll repeat the question real quick for the folks listening in. The question was about how the amount of fuel that airlines consumes might have uh, environmental effects. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. It is, it is one of the most important questions uh, of today that we are working on. Uh, because uh, certainly, as you mentioned, not only the quantity of fuel that uh, we are uh, consuming, that we are putting out this emission at a very high altitude. <laughs> so, 
So uh, that in that altitude, you're not supposed to pollute that altitude for all of us. So um, just to uh, give you the idea, uh, CO2 emission from worldwide aviation, uh, scholars are thinking about 3% uh, uh, due to the aviation. So it, it's debatable, but uh, nonetheless, um, however small that percentage may be, uh, we have to uh, protect our environment. So uh, we are very, very heavy. NASA Aeronautics is very heavy on developing technologies from both uh, aircraft technologies and uh, engine technologies to reduce this uh, fuel uh, uh, consumption, uh, due to fuel consumption uh, to impact to environment impact. As an, as an example, uh, the concept that we're working on, you can see uh, the scale model outside in the lobby, uh, which is a blended uh, wing body, as we call it. So it looks like a stingray. Uh, so you could, you could almost think of it as of a, a flying wing, but it's a different uh, actual concept. That, con that configuration itself with a uh, light material and uh, advanced engines could save uh, fuel consumption by 50%, 5 zero. So that's the kind of revolutionary technologies that we're working on. Certainly we're helping the current uh, uh, aircraft and propulsion system as well to save uh, fuel as much as we can. And we're also working on uh, alternative fuel, uh, re renewable alternative fuels that can uh, reduce the uh, uh, emittent uh, from the uh, fossil fuels uh, significantly. So. so for full disclosure, I got my undergraduate degree at the University of Texas. So I have to throw you a softball here. <laughs> That's right, look at Morin. Um, so I'm throwing you a softball here, which is um, these things called winglets. Now, what, what are they again? Uh, yes. <laughs> you see this uh, little uh, device uh, at, the, at the end of the wing. Texas, this is like Longhorn on, on cattle, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> Hence the Texas yeah, yeah. thing. And they've Te actually developed it, you too. Te Texas rendering of the winglets. Uh, <laughs> that, that was, uh, uh, the idea was uh, originated from uh, NASA uh, research, uh, as a matter of fact. And it um, uh, reduces the uh, uh, wingtip, so-called wingtip vortex, and to make it, uh, uh, as a layman's term or everyday's term, uh, it reduces the air t uh, turbulence or disturbance at the wingtip. So it, that, by installing those uh, small devices, uh, reduces quite a bit of fuel consumption. That's why um, I think Southwest uh, uh, retrofitted all the Boeing 737 uh, airplanes with this little device. And um, that's, the, that's a great uh, software that you gave me. So that's the kind of uh, real uh, contribution that we're making. And hopefully the fuel saving will improve uh, or protect the environment and also uh, uh, come to a little bit uh, cheaper airfare for all of us. I don't want to get the figures wrong, but I understand it's been millions of pounds of carbon saved from emission into the atmosphere, as well as maybe as much as two or three billion in fuel costs, yep. uh, just up to, up to the present. Uh, it's had a big impact, and that's just what it, it's apparently a small thing, you know? But it's a result of research, right? You gotta, you gotta spend money to make money. You've got to put some effort into that upfront uh, ideation or creation of concepts in order for us to, to have the technological advantage we need uh, for us to remain competitive. Yeah, if I may just add one more. Um, you, you all uh, hear this big noise uh, coming off from the jet engines. And also we are doing a lot of research to reduce the jet noise, to reduce the footprint. We cannot remove, eliminate all uh, jet noise. Is, is a violation of physics. <laughs> but uh, we can certainly reduce uh, the footprint. And um, as, as an example, uh, Chicago O'Hare, uh, all of our 25 or so major airports are landlocked, meaning that they, they cannot expand any, uh, in any direction because they, they're all surrounded by this neighborhood. And um, uh, Chicago O'Hare is one of the busiest airports, and they run uh, uh, three or four uh, runways, uh, two, three runways at, simultaneously. Um, the houses around the Chicago uh, O'Hare Airport, uh, FAA has, has been spending about thirty to $40,000 per house to seal off uh, the, all the windows and so on uh, to uh, reduce that uh, noise impact to the neighbors. Um, that is certainly uh, uh, one way to do it. 
But uh, in combination of that, we got to uh, work on technologies to reduce uh, noise and make these airplanes quiet, quieter. So if you stand by the airport, as, as, as Mason said, I'm an airplane nut. Um, <laughs> if you enjoy stay, standing uh, next to the airport and listening to it, uh, the uh, Boeing 787 compared to uh, 707 or 727 or whatever the old models will be markedly quiet. And you will notice that you don't need any scientific measurement. <laughs> you, you will notice markedly quiet uh, airplane coming off from that uh, jets. And uh, you will see also this uh, sawtooth uh, shape nozzle. And in the video, you might have cat catch that. If you haven't, please come and visit our website. And there's ample information about what we call Chevron nozzle. And that is also a collaboration. Uh, the idea came from us and collaboration with NASA and industry and to reduce that engine noise uh, by, uh, just like winglet, uh, by putting this uh, saltus uh, serrated uh, nozzle uh, shape, it's reducing the uh, engine noise significantly. Great, thank you guys. So I think we have a question now from social media. We do, we have a question from Twitter. Connor Schmidt asks, how did these spin-off technologies get into the private sector? Do companies see and adopt them or do you bring them to industry? Well, it's really, I'll take that, I guess. Um, it's, it's really, a, it's a combination of different uh, mechanisms that we use to make that happen. Uh, you can go to spinoff.nasa.gov to learn about some of the spinoffs. We've also got um, a technology.nasa.gov where we describe the tech transfer process, which is maybe a little, the sort of thing that maybe Aiden uh, and Sophie won't be too interested in, so I'm not going to go into that so much here. But I will point out that we have a number of different ways of doing this, including licensing technologies, um, including simply disseminating our information through uh, technol technology reports. Um, remember, what we do here is taxpayer funded. We owe it to the country to give this kind of uh, information, these kinds of technologies back to the public. And so it's, it's important for us to achieve that. And I think we do actually a very good job of it. In fact, if you look across the federal agencies, uh, NASA is uh, the leader in invention disclosures. It was last year, uh, ahead of other agencies with larger budgets. Uh, I think what that speaks to is first the kind of innovation we do, but also that we really are quite good at this whole tech transfer thing and we take it quite seriously. Are there any other questions over here? If you say it, I'll repeat it. Interesting to uh, to hear it, obviously, before it comes to us years later as a record. Um, I also have a degree in medieval studies, and so I'm sort of interested in that you Go both. Chaucer. <laughs> <laughs> there, we're out there, secret medievalists. Um, I find it interesting that you both sort of brought up that you're interested in other things, that you speak other languages, and I'm wondering, you know, you work in science, you work with scientists, but do you think? that you're more flexible and more open to using things in a different way because you have <coughs> interests that are not necessarily just hard science. Plugging one for the liberal arts people here. <laughs> should, I, should I try that one or do you want to? You know, okay. Uh, I, yeah, I think, to, to be honest, uh, over, over the years I've come to appreciate that uh, what people normally take to be uh, disparate uh, fields of endeavor, you know, let's say the humanities versus the sciences. Um, at the core, there's something just fundamentally human about all of that. You know, I think that the, the skills that one develops in thinking about literature, for example, or history, or, or the social sciences, or other things like that, uh, do translate actually pretty well into technical areas because it really, at, at its heart, it's about being creative, being rigorous in investigation, uh, and trying to look deeply into something and understand it. You know, those kinds of tools really, uh, when you distill them out, aren't that different from one discipline to another. Now, obviously, uh, calculus does not come up too often in medieval literature, um, but uh, those are the sort of specifics. That's kind of the veneer of the tools that one would want to use. I guess I would, uh, so I know a, a person who works on spacecraft mode and fault architecture, which is the, uh, the, uh, the software within a spacecraft that uh, makes sure that it doesn't make mistakes or when it does, it uh, can self-correct for them. A, a very you know, abstruse kind of topic that has to do with a lot of technical stuff, uh, but he has a PhD in art history. Uh, what I'm suggesting here is that I don't think that really technology is all that different or distant from what we generally uh, can achieve as, as people. I, I dislike this notion that people say I'm, I'm good at math or I'm bad at uh, uh, English or these sorts of things. I think it's just a matter of what you're really passionate about. And I, I think there, um, the lesson certainly for Sophie and Aiden, 
uh, is uh, find something you're really interested in and don't give up on it. You know, really work it hard. There's no substitute for hard work. Uh, so I do think that being uh, creative, though, is also at the, the core of a lot of these things. One of the reasons I enjoy my job at NASA is I get to think about the future. Um, my kids call me NASA's head inventor, and that's <laughs> maybe true. I don't know. Uh, others might disagree. Uh, but again, w with engineering, I think typically people don't see that it's a creative discipline. You know, something about engineers, we can't dress ourselves well. We, uh, you know, we have a hard time interacting with people. Uh, that's not to be mistaken for failing to be creative, though. And I think a lot of the passion that you see among NASA employees and people who work with NASA um, is because they want the opportunity to create the future. And that creativity, I think, really drives uh, how people work on these kinds of technical projects. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, and that's a great question, by the way. Um, I think I can bring my own personal experience that I came to this country uh, 30 years ago uh, from originally Korea. And um, if you go back to Korea, which is very homogeneous society, uh, you, you, you see people just like me, looking just like me. But look around this room, and uh, we all have very diverse, uh, in all aspects, uh, not just gender or uh, ethnicity, but uh, what, I think what makes uh, our country great, uh, I, I think I can really say great nation in the world, uh, is this diversity. So. Um, not just technical disciplines, not just anything gender or uh, any other uh, dimensions, but all aspects and all inclusive dimensions of diversity. I think when we have that, uh, we can come up with some great uh, innovation and uh, great thinking and uh, ideas. And I see that happening on uh, a daily basis uh, working in this agency. So uh, it's very gratifying. Great question. Jennifer, Jennifer, I interrupt one second. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, we are down to one microphone, so please remember to wait for the mic. Uh, when you raise your, raise your hand high, wait for the mic, and state your name and where you're from. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. And there is one in the back. Thank you for that, John. Hello, I'm Dory Ansel Walker, a special needs teacher from Georgia. And um, Colonel Boland mentioned the exoskeleton, how it's being used in space, and he also mentioned that it is now being used looking to be used for disabled you know, people. Are there any other technologies that they have brought from space to use for our disabled people? Uh, this, uh, well, do you have any ideas? OK, well, I mean, <laughs> I'll give you a couple of examples of uh, some of the spin-offs that have come from NASA that have uh, really had a big impact on medicine generally. Now, Bill Gerstenmeier, in, in the previous talk, gave you some great examples of things that are current. And uh, let me just, for a bit of a throwback to the past, I'll mention um, some of the medical imaging that we take for granted today, say through ultrasound or, or mammograms, for example. Uh, these have revolutionized uh, diagnosis of disease and even treatment in some cases. Uh, that came originally from NASA's science, from our need to process images and take large amounts of data filter them appropriately and come up with information that we extract, sort of data mining from that. Uh, so from, you know, from space to you is, is that story. Uh, there have been actually a number of uh, different uh, medicines developed thanks to the space program. There's been a number of uh, research areas that have started up thanks to microgravity. It turns out that certain kinds of protein crystals grow particularly well in zero gravity. And it might be that the ability to um, grow crystals from, uh, let's say, instead of 90% or 80% purity or uh, perfection, which we can do on the ground, to near 100%, which we can do in space, can make all the difference in new uh, kinds of drugs. So there's a lot of exciting work going on. I don't want to uh, be overly speculative about where it would leave because, you know, health is something we all take quite seriously. But uh, I can assure you that NASA, particularly the International Space Station, will continue to be a resource that will have a big impact on medicine for the future. Great. We have another question from social media. I have a, a question from Twitter. It's a technology question. Um, at Storytelling asks, how do you design spacesuits for ISS astronauts if they grow two to three inches in space? <laughs> this is actually not the best question for me to answer. However, I will offer a couple of, of things. First of all, um, how we design spacesuits in general. Let me point out a couple of mechanisms. Certainly, we work with companies. We also have our own internal experts uh, on these kinds of technologies. But another mechanism that we use for designing things like spacesuits, in fact, specifically spacesuits, is uh, prize competitions. Now, uh, Ms. Gustetic here is actually our program executive for prizes at the agency. It's a long story. She could probably tell you better than I will. But just in this context, uh, we just recently held a prize competition for designing a new astronaut glove. Uh, 
uh, and, and the winner won, I think it was a $200,000 prize for coming up with a design that we had never seen before that answers a lot of open questions and is actually better performing than things we'd had in the past. Uh, this general category of ideas is called open innovation. Uh, we're trying hard, and I think we're succeeding at NASA, to bring in the best ideas from wherever they can be found, whether it's through traditional mechanisms like grants and, and contracts with companies or academia, or also incentivizing new ideas through prize competitions. There's some very exciting prizes we're going to be offering in the near future. Uh, some of the ones we've currently got going on include the Night Rover Challenge, where we're trying to encourage the development of new battery technologies uh, for application in things like letting a rover survive the 14-day lunar night. It's a very difficult and interesting challenge. It involves all aspects of uh, space travel and uh, interesting technology problems. Uh, one that we recently completed, which I think Jay could talk about, is the so-called Green Flight Challenge, where we offered a prize purse of, I think, $1.6 or so uh, to incentivize the development of uh, a hybrid electric aircraft, a green aviation. Uh, in fact, the requirement, I think, was something like 200 passenger miles per gallon or miles per gallon per passenger. Uh, the winner of that competition, the so-called Pipistrol aircraft, achieved 400 miles per gallon per passenger. So we're talking about the impact of NASA research on the environment. Just that one event might have blown the doors open on hybrid electric aviation. Through you know, prizes and, and other kinds of challenges like this, we can incentivize technology development from very non-traditional sources. So it gets that, um, you know, the, the diversity of ideas that are available in our nation. And also, to be frank, we only pay when we get results. You know, if no one won that prize, we'd still have the money and we could be spending it on other things as well. So it's a great way for us to leverage our resources and a great way to involve the entire nation in solving problems of interest to NASA. I believe there's a question over here. No? No question over here? Okay, so then I will go. There's one over here. But we'll wait for the microphone to run around again. <laughs> Sorry, folks uh, watching online. We're working with one microphone, like John said. But a very quick microphone runner. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Wallace from Tacoma Park, Maryland. One of the questions that kind of comes up in some of the smaller meetings that I go to outside of a NASA open house is, um, when you have spin-offs and you license those uh, technologies to organizations, and I know we've paid for them and we get them back through these organizations that have to develop them. I, I mean, I didn't license one of those technologies personally. So um, my understanding is it's free, and I may be wrong. Um, but isn't there a way to maybe take a look at that again so that maybe when you license, you actually, that they actually pay you for the NASA for the license so that you can fund future uh, space exploration? A really bad question. Nasty <laughs> question. No, no, it's, a great, it's a great question. I mean, I think what it gets at, uh, at its core is, you know, how can, we, uh, how can we get more resources at NASA for doing the work that we want to do? And I, I certainly appreciate the passion in the public for wanting NASA to be supported well. And I think that, you know, again, we are uh, supported. The Space Technology Program, as an example, which you heard about just recently, does enjoy uh, broad bipartisan support and support from, from Congress. For, uh, for spin-offs specifically or, or uh, tech transfer, you know, Virtually all of the research that happens at NASA, maybe all of it, in fact, by law, is available publicly. Uh, it's written up in technical reports, written in journal papers. Uh, you can also contact NASA people and talk to us about these things. It's one of the great things about working at NASA. Uh, unlike, let's say, working on classified technology, we are, in fact, working on ideas that are directly available to the public for, for our benefit. Um, in terms of bringing in money, you know, it sort of depends on the license and, the, and what the technology is, it's kind of a long story. Uh, but I'll say that uh, one thing we've innovated is an online tool, the so-called uh, uh, online partnering tool. If you go to, again, technology.nasa.gov, uh, there's a quick little web form you can fill out, you send that in, uh, there's some processing on that that happens, and you get to talk to an actual NASA person about your technology interests, <clears throat> and we can help make those connections much more effectively. So so, you know, we are in fact entering the 20th century when it comes to how to interact with people and businesses using the internet, believe it or not, to enable this process. Um, the, we're going even farther and faster in this general area. Um, if you keep an eye on uh, the news, you'll see some other great work that we're doing in how to transfer technology even more effectively in the future. I'd just like to thank you, uh, your support as well. Um, I, I think the public support uh, exhibited, uh, like right now, uh, it is what we need, and certainly, uh, as a public organization, we got to do our best to uh, use taxpayers' dollars in the most uh, effective and efficient way. So we'll continue to do that. But um, I think um, 
we all recognize that NASA is our pride, our, our national pride. And uh, one of the privileges uh, and uh, gr most gratifying things that uh, uh, people working at NASA uh, sometimes get is when we travel uh, uh, foreign countries, and it could be just any casual dinner. Uh, we, we would just talk about NASA stuff. Again, I said stuff is a technical term. Uh, NASA stuff sure, at, at dinner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it happened to me. Uh, a very nice uh, family sitting behind us just turned around and, do you work for NASA? So they said, yes. And we just started talking. <laughs> and they were just fascinated by what we do. And I think you all know, uh, both in aeronautics and space side, we do some unimaginable things, and uh, th the rest of the world uh, knows about it, and they appreciate that. And uh, they uh, respect uh, what our country can do uh, through NASA. So um, I continue to uh, be uh, grateful for public support, but uh, that's the type of uh, support we need to continue to have. I want to take a moment to thank Dr. Shin and Dr. Peck for being with us today on this panel and thanking all of you for your great questions, not only in the audience but on social media. Um, I hope you all learned a little bit about tech transfer and some of NASA's technology work today and walk away with them, some interesting elevator stories to tell your friends about the types of things that NASA is doing. So with that, thank you. Back to John. Welcome back. For those uh, in the audience, again, just a reminder, raise, when you have a question, raise your hand really, really high so we can see you and get to you. Uh, we'll, we'll do our best. Um, the latest uh, robotic space technology spinoff derived from NASA's Robonaut 2 project may somebody help astronauts stay healthier in space with an added benefit of assisting paraplegics down here on Earth. NASA and the Florida Institute of Human and Machine Cognition of Pennsylvania, Florida, with the help of engineers from Oceaneering Space Systems of Houston, had jointly developed a robotic exoskeleton called X1. The 57-pound device is a robot that humans could wear over his or her body either to assist or inhibit movement of leg joints. In the inhibit mode, the robotic device would be used in space exercise machine to supply resistance against leg movement. The same technology would be used to reverse on the ground, potentially helping some individuals walk for the first time. To tell us more about the development of the exoskeleton is Bill Bluthman, the deputy branch chief of the Robotic Systems Technology Branch in the Software, Robotics, and Simulation Division at NASA's Johnson Space Center. And demonstrating the exoskeleton and the project, our project engineers, Roger Rov Rovkamp and Jonathan Rogers. Gentlemen. Thank, thank you, John. Um, so I'm really uh, honored to be here with a couple of our bright young engineers here today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, I have another job besides the uh, branch job, which is uh, I lead a project called Human, uh, human Robotic Systems Within Space Technology here. And when, when I think of human robotic systems, I think of a system that 
is a robot that really makes an astronaut's job easier. Um, whether that be working shoulder to shoulder with an astronaut doing some of the dull, dangerous, and dirty, which are kind of the traditional uh, three things that robots really are good for um, when working you know, with or side by side with humans, kind of do the stuff that we don't want to do. I also think of uh, machines that uh, astronauts might ride on top of or inside of. Uh, and then maybe another thing that's maybe a little bit less clear is robots uh, uh, operating ahead of crew's arrival to a destination, so maybe doing some scouting beforehand. Uh, and then after crew's departure, maybe cleaning up and uh, doing some work afterwards, kind of collecting samples or you know, doing some post-scene analysis. Um, and then there's this new concept of uh, a human robotic system, and we have a couple of them we're going to show you here today that are wearable uh, robots. Uh, Roger's wearing the X1 exoskeleton. It's a lower body exoskeleton. Um, and as John mentioned, it was developed in partnership with the Institute for Human Machine Cognition in Pensacola, Florida. And uh, Jonathan's wearing our RoboGlove, which was developed in partnership with General Motors. Um, so within NASA, it's really important to find these partnerships because it really gives us a nice conduit to bring our space technologies really back to Earth. Um, but as we set these up, it's really important for us not just to pick anybody, but we really need to find organizations that have a shared vision. Um, as you can imagine, um, in the case of Robonaut, which we're really not talking about today, but um, you know, these are in the Robonaut family tree, we had this shared vision of uh, humans robots working shoulder to shoulder. Uh, in space you know, with astronauts, and then on the factory floor uh, with humans in, in the same proximity as robots. Uh, that's not the case it is now. They tend, tend to have uh, light shields around any robots in manufacturing, and if a human walks in that, the robot stops and the line stops. So we really have that shared vision. Um, as far as exoskeletons are concerned, you know, when I think of an exoskeleton, I think of the Iron Man suit, maybe the uh, power loaders from Aliens. Um, these, these machines that really augment the capabilities of humans, um, maybe in some cases weaponizing the humans. Um, and that's really not what we're going to do, at least initially. Um, our job is, again, to make humans uh, work a little bit easier. So in the case of Rob RoboGlove, um, our space application might be that uh, they integrate with a spacesuit. So when our astronauts put on a spacesuit, uh, we pressurize them, and the, the hands really want to stay open. Um, and it takes work for the astronauts to close their grips. Um, if, with a device like this RoboGlove, when you close the grip, uh, when you trigger a sensor, it'll hold that position, allowing the person inside to relax. Um, you could have a very similar type application with um, folks on a factory floor where, um, as they work their stuff, they could let the machine carry some of the load, and they would do more of the fine positioning. Um, possibly reducing repetitive stress injuries. What we've seen is that typically, you know, running your wrist is pretty easy, but when you do it with your, when you're holding something, you run your wrist, uh, you feel a little bit more strain. So I think, you know, anybody out there could do this and feel the difference between just moving your wrist naturally and then do, holding a fist and doing the same. Um, and then with exoskeleton, our um, initial application of space is really going to be um, the kind of things of measuring what the uh, astronaut's strength is. So it really allows us to target very specific joints on the body um, for how much strength. And right now, how we do it is before the mission, and then after mi the mission, we measure the astronauts. The thought being with some, a device like this is that we could um, really frequently measure it to see how their strength um, changes over the course of their mission. Um, and then maybe the next application would be instead of augmenting the strength, uh, of the crew, we'd really resist them, uh, leading to a very, very compact exercise device. Um, that's enough talking by me. How about we hand things over to Roger and Jonathan, uh, let them show you the robots and talk a little about them. Roger, right, why don't you go first? Thank you. Uh, so as Bill mentioned, there are a number of applications for the X1. Uh, we have assisted uh, mobility, uh, resist, resisted mobility, which is exercise, and then uh, strict measurement, which is also called dynamometry. Uh, but a little bit about the hardware. Um, we have four active degrees of freedom, which active essentially means powered, uh, and passive degrees of freedom. We have six of those. Uh, we have motor drivers, which essentially talk directly to the motors, located at each joint. And then we have a higher level computer that sends commands to those motor drivers um, in a sort of general sense and uh, allows for precise uh, control of the device. Uh, we also have a lot of adjustability. We wanted a, a lot of people to be able to get in this device uh, so we could evaluate its 
uh, efficacy for these different applications. Uh, so we have adjustability in the thighs and in the, the ankles and in the hips. So it's a very versatile device. Um, little demonstration. So we have uh, limit stops um, in key places to protect the, the person in the suit. And that is a, it's a very important application. And so one of the things with this project, um, we leveraged a lot of R2 technology. Um, and R2 went through a lot of safety reviews to fly it on uh, board ISS. And so we're able to learn from that and impart a lot of that technology into this system to make it a very safe system. Uh, so that's what I have on next. Sure, thanks, Roger. Um, so while this, this glove may not look a whole lot like a Robonaut, a lot of the technology is pulled right from it and then adapted for a new application. And having those types of uh, technologies in our back pocket ready to go for uh, a challenge that might come up is, is key to uh, what we're trying to do at JSC. So in here I've got four motors that then can pull tendons which run through uh, this glove and supplement my grasp strength. I, uh, I brought a bottle of water and while it's not really heavy you can get the idea and you can hear the, the glove grip down on it. So to uh, actuate it, I've got a, uh, a force sensitive resistor, or basically a, a simple thin button in my thumb. And when I press down and start a grasp, the, uh, the glove supplements my, uh, my strength. So with a, a larger, heavier item, my arm and shoulder are still bearing the weight of that item, but uh, my, my hand is not getting tired. So uh, on board, we've got motor drivers that are, again, Robonaut technology, just packaged slightly differently. And uh, to expedite our development process and really uh, develop a topic and, and progress through it, um, I've just got a simple off-the-shelf battery pack that I can wear in my belt. Our second generation is looking at uh, new technologies, different batteries that are smaller and more compact and um, have longer life. Uh, NASA's application for this, as Bill alluded to, is uh, for spacewalks. Um, earlier, uh, Mr. Gerstenmeyer uh, said that we spent approximately three or four months building the space station just in spacewalk time alone. And uh, the astronauts that go through that uh, are troopers. That's a lot of hard work and uh, we commonly hear about uh, their hands being extremely tired and blistered when they come back in. And a lot of that is just due to fighting the force uh, of the, the ballooning of the glove in the spacesuit. So if we can apply a technology like this to help them close that glove and alleviate some of the stress, that's a huge payoff. And uh, Bill mentioned for our, our colleagues at General Motors, they have operators on assembly lines moving heavy objects around uh, all day, every day. And if we can help them with that, it's a, it's a huge payoff there as well here on Earth. Okay, with that, that's kind of our brief introduction. We'd like to open up uh, to the audience for any questions you might have. Ben Stuhl from uh, McLean, Virginia. Um, what sort of computing power does it take? You know, does it take a cell phone or a calculator or a supercomputer? What does it take? Um, well, for the exoskeleton, we use what's called a, a Nano ETX. It was a small computer that's uh, packaged in the back of the, the backpack. So not as much as you, as you would think. So with this system, we actually uh, allow a lot of the computing to happen distributed through the, uh, through the device. So we actually have multiple computers on board. Um, but it's, it's very minimal. For uh, RoboGlove, we have a, uh, a small board here on the back side mm -hmm. of the glove um, with a board we call the cufflink, and it's based around a Netduino. And uh, then there's two other boards here that uh, locally have processing power to drive the motors to specified positions and so forth. Jim Edwards Hewitt uh, from Alexandria, Virginia, uh, Redshift42 on Twitter. Um, I, I know these, uh, these uh, leg attachments are for measuring strength. Uh, you know, how far are we from having, since I know a number of people with, with bad knees who can't walk very far and that kind of thing, and there's only so much medicine can do for them, how far are we from having assistive devices that would, uh, that would let them you know, walk normally? Well, so we're, we're kind of engaging in this really, you know, we're, we are a research organization as, as are our uh, partners at uh, HMC. Um, the concept is we really want to develop the technology to pass the point where 
we would hand that over to people who professionally do these clinical type trials. Um, and I don't, I don't necessarily want to guess, but it could happen within probably, I don't know, maybe one to two more generations of this design. More questions. Hi, I'm oh. Aiden. I asked a question earlier. Yeah, so hey, my I question is, in the video, the X1 robo, well, the thing he's <laughs> wearing, wearing, had two things that come out like this, and, but I don't see them right now. So I think right at the beginning, Aiden, is what you're talking about? Oh. Yeah, so the, the two parts you're referring parts to are... Parts that come out like this? Yeah, those are, those are this part here. At the time, they, were, they didn't have coverage. Right now, we've got soft good skins to make it soft. Um, so it's, it's this part and this part. Are <laughs> <laughs> there questions? Oh, so many questions. <laughs> Hi, Jeff Wallace, uh, Rockman 528 on Twitter. Uh, so, what, what's, what, give us some kind of idea about what kind of force, what kind of assistance can you actually provide in a way that we can understand? Can you crush a bowling ball with that thing or what? Well, <laughs> not quite. Um, you can get an extra five to 10 pounds of grip force out of this device, which is enough to make a difference. And that, that's really the key for it. It's not going to make you superhuman, at least not yet. But uh, it's, it's designed just to make things uh, easier for you. So for the exoskeleton, so we have to actually be designed to measure uh, peak strength. Therefore, we have to assist uh, you know, peak strength. So it's actually, uh, we have a lot of capability in this system <coughs> as well. So. Hi, I'm Dina Rosenberg from Boulder, Colorado. I'm Viola Rolls on Twitter. Um, my question was, are all the astronauts roughly the same size? I'm only five feet tall, and I can't imagine that I would also fit in that exoskeleton or that glove. It would come up to my bicep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't, I don't believe they are. And uh, the way we account for that is uh, we have what's called a, a distribution of uh, a sample population that we design the device to. Um, and it's actually one of the more difficult challenges in a device like this, not only to make it adjustable, but to make it easily adjustable uh, on orbit. So. We definitely have to account for all those different folks, and uh, so it's a very it's a difficult design challenge. But this device uh, uh, has a wide range of, of uh, users. Yeah. So you've done people about my height. I'm six two, and done people as short as about what, five two or so. Yeah. In the in the device. So so Rogers certainly think of that as he designs these things, these uh, devices. Now for the glove, uh, this is our first generation. And uh, it was designed for uh, an engineer with a much larger hand than I have. Uh, so it's pretty tight around, it's, it's cinched down pretty tight around me. Um, in our newer generations, we have a small, medium, and large. And there's actually added variability inside the, uh, the forearm portion to, uh, to fit a wider range of people. And that's, you know, that's one of the things that we learned uh, in developing this first generation is where do we need the variability and how much should we put in it? Thanks. We have time for two more questions. One here in the back. Yeah. Hi there. I'm Valley, and I am on Twitter, but for political reasons, I shan't share my Twitter name. Okay. Um, the campaign's done. Um, with all due credit to Alan Steele, a science fiction writer, really nice guy, and his space jockeys. What's the feasibility? It, you know, this is way out there, but what's the feasibility of embodying, of embedding, both those kinds of of the exoskeletons, but also your gripping device and a number of others to be able to custom suit for a guy or gal to go out there and mine asteroids. I mean, mining asteroids is way out in the future. But could we transform our mobile capability to be able to do this in the vacuum of space or for that matter, just do it in the hard winter climates of Alaska and the Yukon where they need that kind of thing to be able to manipulate nature and do drilling and so on. So could we adapt that technology to help us be able to do this in environments that are hostile to man? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I mean, that's kind of what, what we do. And as we went in, part of the fact that we had partnerships here is we were thinking not just you know, our in space, you know, mining asteroid uh, applications in the future. Um, and I think that would really involve taking these kind of technologies and probably future generations of these technologies and uh, integrating with the suits. 
so that uh, you know they were kind of part of a uh, human human machine uh, interface. So, so that that's I think down one front, and presumably that it would really just be somebody that had a a strong need to do just that uh, motivation to do it quickly. And I think you know with the right uh, motivation we could certainly you know bring these sort of capabilities to. Uh, hostile environment, whether it be the host hostile environment of space or the hostile environments we see here on Earth. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Wallace of Tacoma Park, Maryland. My hashtag is storytelling. And um, I just, uh, this past weekend, I spent, uh, as a, I was a judge at a first Lego tournament. And, oh, you guys are nodding, that's good. <laughs> and, um, a lot, one of the kids, one of the teams created an exoskeleton for a disabled former fireman to, who went in and saved some people from a fire, even though he was, you know, an elder, like 80 years old. He was empowered to save that. And it was really cool watching the kids come up with amazing things that was mostly for seniors, these, these products. What um, is NASA doing to help more and more, to facilitate more and more NASA engineers, technicians, et cetera, to mentor kids in this idea, in this area of innovation? That is as soft as a softball for us. So, <laughs> so these two guys are really come directly out of our uh, first robotics pipeline. So Jonathan was on our uh, local team at NASA Johnson as, as a high school student. He uh, came to work as a co-op at NASA and then has been working uh, at JSC on Robonaut, amongst other things, for about six or seven years. Um, Roger's maybe a little bit more non-traditional uh, uh, farm club kid where we met him as a sophomore in college. He came out and was a college mentor on our, our first team. Um, and, you know, he's kind of grown up with us. And for me, me, I got my job, you know, working initially Robonaut by, I went out and volunteered on a first team. Uh, and that's kind of how I made my transition from, I was working space station at the time, and that's how I got back into technology. So we've um, worked with hundreds and hundreds of uh, young men and women. Uh, and, you know, many of them are doing really great things. Okay, we have one final question from Twitter, and that is, can the exoskeleton also be used from inside a spacesuit? Yeah, so, so at this point it can't be, but that's really one of our, um, our longer term goals is really to have this be part of uh, a suit that might make a crew more capable uh, during the spacewalks. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. I'll try to resolve the microphone issue at, at part two. This was the afternoon session. Uh, there's an afternoon session after this. Uh, thanks, for everyone, for joining us for the morning session. Uh, we learned a lot today about future technologies and how technology is helping us here on Earth and the future of human spaceflight. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you.